بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا وإمامنا وقدوتنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to lessons in fiqh we're still studying the chapter that deals with Mustafa Khushu'a in prayer Khushu'a which is humility in prayer or submissiveness in prayer and this is very very essential because the essence of your prayer is what you benefit out of it and this is the greatest thing that one could benefit out of his prayer is to reach the level, level of khushur and we have uh, uh, hadith number 188 brother muhammad can you please read it for us yes bismillahirrahmanirrahim again no. i have to interrupt i apologize We've stated before that saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim before every hadith we read is not correct simply because it is not part of the Sunnah to read Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When do we read Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Noor? Uh, before, as, uh, in the first of uh, Surah. B in the beginning of every Surah of the Holy Quran with the exception of Surah At-Tawbah. But other than that, we generally speak and say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and then afterwards we go on and to study. Because imagine what would happen if we are in a circle of knowledge of ilm and before everyone speaks he says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah and then he answers or asks a question. This would, would take too long and the Prophet didn't do this. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Go ahead. Narrated Anas radiallahu an, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If supper is brought, if supper, if supper is brought, and the prayer is ready, start with it, the food, before you pray, the Maghrib. Okay, now this hadith has lots of brackets in it, so uh, just to explain it before going into uh, the things it, it has, the Prophet says, if supper is brought, if the food is present in front of you and Maghrib has been called the prayer so what should I start with the Prophet says as salam start with your food start with your supper with your dinner with your fatur with whatever meal it is and before we go even to explaining the hadith Mustafa has a question uh, what about in Ramadan we see that sometimes people they just eat and forget praying or they delay too much well, the hadith tells you to begin with supper, to begin with the food. Now, the extent of eating is an issue that one should, you know, contemplate on. Because the Prophet says, begin with supper, begin with the food, so that you are not distracted when you pray. Because if you pray while you're hungry, and you're thinking of the food, and you can smell it, and you start to have images and, and, and flashbacks and so on, this is not... Uh, uh, wanted or requested in, in prayer but the extent of how long should I eat because I could eat like a dish in front of me and then I'm full and the person said well I have to finish the whole table with six or seven different types of, of, of food and drinks and so on and this th we will come to talk about this inshallah later on Abu Malik yes I want to ask uh, does the hadith only uh, talk about supper or any other meal, like no. if it's calling Zuhr, I'm going to eat breakfast maybe. Okay, that's, that's a good question. And to answer this, we have to look into the Sunnah. And the Sunnah says to us that the Prophet ﷺ said that there is no acceptable prayer, la salat, in the presence of food or when you are in, in the need to answer the call of nature. The, pre the Prophet says, la salat, which means no prayer accepted or completed or it, you can have many interpretation but it all pours in the same direction it all tells you that you have to pray with a clear conscience and with nothing bothering you or uh, uh, occupying your mind any questions uh, okay uh, does this mean that it actually reduces the thawab the reward or it just you cannot pray at this time See, this so is how, how, yes, this is how some uh, uh, scholars interpret it. When, they, when the Prophet says, La salata, does he 
tell us that the prayer itself is void? Or does he tell us that la salata, meaning there's no prayer, perfect? This is the most authentic uh, choice, that la salat, meaning it's not perfect, it's incomplete. Now, going back to our hadith, before going back to our hadith, Abu Malik. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, okay. If somebody was asleep and they woke up like, and they didn't pray dhuhr, and there's like five minutes left for us, but they're really hungry, what do they do? You know, if they eat, then the dhuhr, you know, the time of dhuhr is one out. What do you think, Fadi? I think then they should pray first. He should pray first. What do you think, Noor? I think uh, he has to pray first. Mustafa? I don't know. Well, give, give, it shot, give it a shot. Well, if I was in their shoes, then I'd just pray. Okay. Yeah, he should, he should uh, pray first. Pray first. Then he should pray first. Why? Well, because if you have two things, which is food and then pray, or you have to pray, otherwise the time will run out and then you would have abandoned prayer deliberately. Scholars say that you have to pray and then come back to uh, your food because there is not enough time. You may delay the prayer if there is an interval that allows you to, d to pray it afterwards. But if it's so tight that if you eat, the time will go out no, you have to pray, which is not five, more than five or ten minutes, and then go back to your meal. This is what the scholars say. So going back <coughs> to our hadith, the hadith tells us that there are things that allow us to delay prayer. I'll repeat that. There are things that allow us to delay prayer, such as presence of food. the presence <coughs> of food. When you're hungry, Abu Malik. Answering the call of nature. Answering the call of nature. Mustafa. Rain. Rain. You can, th this is an excuse for you not to pray in the mosque. It's a, uh, an excuse for you to pray home. What else? Storm. Storm, rain, <laughs> hail, thunder, earthquakes, <laughs> volcanoes. Light. It's all a uh, 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 natural thing. Abu Malik. Sickness. Illness, sickness. Religious lecture? No. Religious lectures does not allow you to delay the prayer if the mosque is next door. So if you hear that, then... Is a lecture in, in, the, in the mosque? On, so yes, yes, because you're in the congregation. Mm -hmm. This is not delaying it, you're praying it on time. But are there things, if we consume them, allow us to not to pray in the mosque? Garlic and Garlic onions. Garlic and onions. If you, if you eat them, this gives you the excuse not to pray uh, uh, in the mosque because the Prophet tells you not to pray in the mosque. And do not think that this is an excuse for you to skip prayer. You know, like some of people do, whenever it's time for prayer, they just take, you know, uh, onions from their pockets and... <laughs> What's this? Say, well, I don't want to pray in the mosque, so I have an excuse. This is my alibi. No, this is not acceptable because this is tricking Allah, Azzawajal. You are trying to play tricks on Allah, and Allah knows your intention. So, so this is not acceptable. When it's acceptable, it's when you come home hungry from work, you find that your wife cooked for you, and you start eating. Yarhamakumullah. You start eating, and all of a sudden you discover that there is garlic or onions in, 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 in your food, and it's really bad. Do I answer the call? Uh, do I go to the masjid and pray? No, you have the excuse. Mustafa. Does this exclude, for example, if you can wash your mouth clear of the onions and the garlic smell? I love onions. I adore garlic. And no matter how many times you brush your teeth or you take cinnamon, you take uh, uh, hair, you take uh, mint, whatever you do, the, 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 the smell is not in your mouth. The smell comes from your guts. So it, it stays probably like 15, 20 hours. Personally, I avoid eating garlics and onions because of prayer until I travel abroad. When I travel to non-Muslim countries and there are no mosques, I eat uh, them like hell. I just consume, I love it. But because I love prayer more, I stay away from them. Is it forbidden to eat? No, it's not. But it deters you, it stops you, it prevents you from praying in the mosque. 
So you have to choose. And if you do it intentionally, then you're sinful. And this is a sin by itself. Mustafa. Uh, for someone who frequently eats onions and they still want to go to the masjid, do they actually sin if they go and pray in the masjid? Yes. It's a sin to go to the masjid when people can find the smell of onions or garlics. And it's a sin to eat it deliberately to avoid going to the masjid. So what do you do? You either cook it and eat it, but then the taste is not there. Or you try to eat it like uh, 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 when there is enough time, especially in winter, when you have like 12 hours of night or 14 hours of night, then this is almost enough from uh, after Isha prayer to Fajr prayer, then you may eat it. And y you have to make a choice. So, come back, come again to, uh, coming again to the same hadith, there are excuses from Allah Azza wa to delay prayer or not to pray it with the congregation. Now, uh, one of the clearest examples uh, is what we have here in the hadith where the Prophet says, if the food is there, then you may delay prayer until you have what you need from it. Now, some scholars say, like Shafi and others, uh, if I uh, recall correctly, uh, he says that, yes, you may eat, but only a bite or two, just to take it off your mind, and then go to prayer. But there's another hadith, which is authentic, that the Prophet says, as some, you may sit down, and eat until you had all what you need, you know, until you're satisfied. So this hadith tells you exactly, and he, <coughs> clearly that it's not a bite or two, no, you should eat until you completely, your mind is completely off the food. And, and, and yes. In Ramadan, what I do is I go to the mosque and have some dates and like some hot milk. And then we pray in the mosque and then we go upstairs at the house and eat. Is this better or eating at home till? No, no, this is okay. This is acceptable. A lot of Muslims do this. They break their fast in the masjid. Mm -hmm. Now, is the food present? Yes. No. Not You're food. in the masjid. Now, I'm not talking about... Uh, uh, things that are not present in uh, what you're dreaming uh, uh, in your house. In the masjid, if you're sitting in the masjid and the call for Maghrib is there and you break your fast with dates and milk or whatever and the call for Maghrib is there, the food is not present so you have no problem in praying and then going back to your ha house and uh, uh, finishing your meal and you may also invite us to come and join you. Uh, I think we have to stop here for a short pause Inshallah, we will be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. I believe Brother Mustafa had a question just before the break. Yes. So what if the adhan for Maghrib calls and you're fasting and the food is just on the table? Well, you, you, oh, the, the, the hadith is crystal clear. The hadith tells you, go ahead and eat. And in another version, it tells you to eat until you're satisfied. So you can easily go even ahead if, and eat. Even if you miss Maghrib? Even, even if you miss Maghrib. And that is why in lots of uh, uh, mosques in the Arab world, they delay Maghrib by 10 to 15 minutes. So you have the excuse to do this. But again, you have to balance things. You know, sometimes you could stay for about an, an hour eating and eating and eating. And I don't believe that people would, uh, you know, uh, stiff themselves uh, up fill themselves up with food, and then when they go to pray al-taraweeh, night prayer of Ramadan, you hear the uh, guggling sound of, of water and liquids and food, and whenever they bow, they, you see, see them, you know, almost ready to throw up, and they can only pray two rak'ahs and they go home, retire, th because they can't. This is not the Islamic way of doing it. Abu Malik. Yes, Ahundas, if somebody misses, like, another prayer, do they pray in a jama'ah or do they pray by themselves? Because I heard that some scholars spoke about the second jama'ah. Yes, this is a, a controversial issue, again, that uh, uh, al-Imam al-Albani, may Allah have mercy on him, and those who follow him, say that it is not recommendable to pray more than one jama'ah in the same masjid. Meaning, if I am late and I come to the masjid and find the congregation uh, is over, uh, according to Imam al-Albani, that one should not pray with the other people with him. Everyone should pray alone. 
and there he reported, may Allah have mercy on his soul, some uh, uh, hadiths uh, uh, by Anas and by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud showing that they used to do this. Now, personally, and this is the uh, uh, opinion of the majority of scholars, such as Bin Baz, Bin Uthameen, Bin Taymiyyah, Bin Qayyim, and so on, they say, no, you may pray more than one jama'ah in the same masjid. And the easiest uh, 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 evidence behind this is when the Prophet ﷺ prayed Fajr once, and a man came late. So the Prophet looked at his companions and said, who would go and pay charity to this man by praying with him? And one of them stood up and prayed with him another jama'ah. So this is another jama'ah. Now to differentiate and say, well, it is another jama'ah, but one of the people praying in this jama'ah already prayed a previous jama'ah, you have to have a strong evidence to say, no, you cannot. By saying this, we don't encourage people to make a second, a third, a tenth jama'ah in the same masjid. Because if you lose, if you miss the first jama'ah intentionally, this is a sin by itself. And you cannot make it up by just praying another jama'ah and encouraging people to not pay attention to iqamah and to be with the congregation, with, to be with the group, the majority of Muslims, by saying, well, I can catch the second, third, or tenth jama'ah. But th 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 what appears to me, as it appeared to the majority of scholars, that the hadith of the Prophet, ﷺ, by saying, by instructing one of his followers to pray with this person, a second jama'ah means that it is allowed to pray. Uh, I think we should move on <coughs> to the follow. Or, uh, do you have any questions? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the following hadith, hadith number 189. Narrated by Abu Dhar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, When one of you is praying, he must not remove pebbles from his face, for the mercy is facing him. And Ahmed added to the above hadith, Remove the pebbles once, or leave them. It is also reported in a, in a sahih on the authority of Mu'aqib without mention of the reason. Okay, this hadith shows us that movement does reduce the reward and the submissiveness, the khushu' in your salah. Though this hadith, hadith is weak, yet it means that if you're praying, and if you're praying, and those who have experience this praying on sand when you raise your head from the prostration position you will have pebbles and sand on your face so if you remove them this uh, is considered to be uh, uh, a sort of distraction because you're going to have this every raka and cleaning them is mo this movement is not recommended but the hadith itself is daif so if it's something that is bothering you, you may, you, you may remove it, even if it was sand or so, uh, better than you not concentrating on your prayer. Uh, the following hadith. <coughs> Narrated Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. I asked Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about looking around during prayer. And he said, it is something which the devil snatches from a person's prayer. In another narration of Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, Avoid looking around when you are engaged in prayer, for looking around is destruction. And if you must, and if you must do it, do so in the voluntary prayers. Okay, now, the uh, first part of the hadith is authentic because it's narrated by uh, al-Bukhari. But the second uh, hadith is not authentic, where the Prophet says that you may do this in voluntary prayer. Now, the first hadith, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, is asking the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about looking around, you know, you know about uh, uh, looking at the sides this way. So is it okay? So the Prophet told her sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that this is considered to be uh, uh, the snatching of the devil from a person's prayer. And what does that mean? It means that, as you remember, there is a devil specially uh, uh, found for whispering for wudu. And there's another one specially found to whisper and to distract you from prayer. So do you know the name of, of the, uh, of the uh, shaitan 
concerned with wudu? Al-walhan. Al-walhan. Okay, what about the shaitan uh, uh, concerned with salat, with prayer? Khunzub. His name is Khunzub. Khunzub. Or Khunzub. And the Prophet tells us that if a person is contemplating, concentrating in his prayer, shaitan comes to him. And this happens a lot with people praying. If somebody moves all of a sudden on one of the sides and he just goes, and look at him. Yes, Abu Malik. Is this prayer considered accepted or not? Well, if a person looks sideways with his face and neck, his prayer is accepted. Because the Prophet did not say, as when Aisha asked him, may Allah be pleased with her, he did not say that this voids his prayer. He said that this snatches. The devil snatches from his prayer, which means he takes bits and pieces, parts of it only. So scholars say that if a person uh, 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 looks and turns his head and his neck, if, it's, if it were for a reason, then there's nothing wrong in that. What kind of reason? If he saw something or if he's afraid of something and he looked, then this is acceptable. But if it's, it was not for anything legitimate, he was just looking, then this decreases the reward of his prayer. If he moves entirely with his shoulders, so this is the Qibla I'm praying, and I move this way, the, the scholars say that the, the prayer is void. Because you went away from the Qibla, which is one of the conditions of Salah. So it, it depends on your shoulders and your chest. You should be facing the Qibla. If you move away from it, this voids your prayer. Now, uh, what I've noticed is that lots of the Muslims, lots of the brothers look around without knowing it. Could this be possible? Yes. I know lots of the brothers that when they pray, they look around. It's shaitan. He's making them look around. But they are not aware of it. And it's your duty, it's your job, after he finishes prayer, that you come to him and talk to him in a very nice way and trying to, you know, pamper him and telling him that, you know, lots of people do this without knowing and shaitan is there, I, I, you're my brother, I want you to advise me. And as this uh, a good token, I'll advise you that I've noticed that you look around while, while praying. So try to concentrate a little bit more. This is your duty. Abu Malik. Yes, I want to ask, if somebody like, is like moving in the prayer, moving ahead or trying to get out of the way of something, if he loses balance and falls, is his prayer cut? No. No, not necessarily. If, and this one would say, whoa, is he walking a thin line here? No, it happens if somebody is, you know, really tired, really sleep, and he makes prostration and boom, he falls on his face and he stands up. No, this is something that is not within his control, so it's okay. But uh, I hope it doesn't happen to any of us because then, as, as the brother said, that if a cat comes in while you're praying and people start jumping, and everybody would break into laughter and, and then the prayer would be void. But if it happens, well, inshallah. So he just gets up and finishes his yes, prayer normally? Yes, you, you stand up and finish prayer. And this happens a lot. You know, you may goof and do a lot of things without, you know, paying attention to. For example, in the case of people uh, uh, sitting in the tashahud, a lot of the guys, when the imam says, Allahu Akbar, raises his head and sit for tashahud, a lot of the guys are sleepy. They stand up and uh, thinking that this is the second rakah. And they start reciting the Fatiha. And after five uh, or ten seconds, they look and whoops, everybody's sitting down. And immediately sits down. This does not void your prayer because you did not do it intentionally and it is beyond your control. So again, we come back to the subject, which is that in prayer, you should focus. You should look at the position where you should, should put your head, your, your forehead on, and you should preserve your prayer. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said that Ihsan, which is the highest level of uh, 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 faith and Iman, Ihsan is to worship Allah as if you are looking at Him. Is this possible? Nobody can look at Allah or see Allah on this life. So the Prophet said, 
if you cannot look at him, if you could not reach this level of looking at Allah Azza with your heart and having 100% submissiveness, then remember that he, the Almighty, is looking at you. And this adds more value to our prayer. We have 60 seconds. All right, I just have a small question, if you can correct some information. that I, I read that Bukhari, his, uh, his method in something, in looking in the prayer, is to look ahead of you, not look at the place of uh, sujood. No, no, you should look at the place of sujood. This is when you are looking, in, when you are in the sitting position and you are pointing out your index finger. Some narrations say that you should look until the very end where it points. But the scholars say no, the, the right place is to look where you are sitting. Unfortunately, that our time has run out. And we ha still have few things here and there, but probably, inshallah, if Allah grants us the will and uh, 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 the power, we will go through them next time we meet. And until then, fi amalillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.